I wanted to share a story of an encounter me and a bunch of friends had back in 1968. To this day, I still think about it. Kind of hard to forget no matter how hard I've tried. Anything I say today must be understood as the words of someone only 11 years old. But I'll try to make myself as clear as I can. On a summer evening in 1968, an older cousin, a group of friends, and I decided to play baseball at a nearby baseball field. The field was about four to five blocks away from where I lived, at 3621 Richmond Avenue, and the field was southeast from my house. Anyway, we all got together and were playing. There wasn't enough of us to play team-to-team matchup, so we were rotating one pitcher, one fielder, and the catcher, while the rest batted. There are some train tracks that ran parallel to the baseball field. I mention this because of what happened next. My time came up to pitch, and my older cousin was fielding. One buddy hit a foul ball and it went over the fence towards the railroad tracks. By then it was getting a little past dusk. The field lights weren't too bad. There was a man standing close to where the ball rolled to a stop. My cousin ran towards the fence and yelled at the man to throw the ball back to us. He ignored my cousin, so I ran over and yelled as well. The rest of the guys came over and we started to cuss the guy out for ignoring us. None of us wanted to get near the guy, though. Something about him didn't feel right. One of the guys picked a rock and threw it at what we thought was a bum. The rock came close, but didn't hit the guy. Then a group of guys started to throw rocks. That's when the crap hit the fan. This guy turned towards us slowly and dropped to all fours. What we all saw next, by the dim field lights was not a man, but a snarling, wolf-like creature. My cousin was the first to react by yelling werewolf, and he turned and ran, followed by the rest of us. We ran as a group. Some were lucky and made it home first, peeling off from the rest of us one by one. My cousin and a friend ran to my house and spent the night. We told my parents what we had seen, and of course, they blew us off. My mom told us, what you probably saw was the devil himself for staying out past dusk. Being Hispanic, we always had holy water around the house. We blessed the house, and especially my bedroom. None of us slept that night, and any noise would wake us up. The next morning, we, all the guys, screwed up enough courage to go back to investigate We found our ball where it had landed, but no visible tracks of anything else. Everyone but me agreed that we had seen a werewolf. I kept asking how could it have been a werewolf if there was no full moon last night. Have dogmen sightings been reported near El Paso? The very few people I've told over the years have either laughed at me or thought I was crazy. I'm an old man now, but I needed to get this off my chest. I was out at my grandparents' house, hunting coyotes as usual, this time of the year. I was hiking through my next-door neighbor's land to get to the wood-covered area in the back. While I was hiking, I got the feeling I was being followed by something to my right. I stopped and switched the red tint on my headlamp to my spotlight, but didn't see anything. Then I switched back to my headlamp and pulled my rifle back up and continued my hike. It was 6.15 a.m., and the sun was just coming up. I was sitting in a hide I'd made the day before. That's when I saw something behind a group of trees on my left. It was crouched. I raised my rifle, looked through my scope, and froze when I saw the creature staring back at me. I panicked and fired a shot off. That's when it stood up and took off, deeper into the woods. I sat there probably another 25 minutes before I decided it was safe to head in and did so. Later that day, I grabbed my grandfather and we both went out to where I had seen the creature when it stood up on two legs and took off. 
we measured where I had seen it, and it was roughly seven and a half feet tall. To this day, I'm terrified to go out at night or in the early morning hours. Back in 2004, my husband and I were given three of our grandchildren to raise. They were boys, aged one and a half, three, and four and a half years old. The boys were followed a few months later by their sister, a newborn, who was also given to us to raise. After having raised our children, my husband and I found ourselves as new parents. We lived in a small town in New England, so small that you could step out of the house and see the police station, fire department, and post office, just beyond the house. When I was young, we had stop signs downtown where there are stoplights now. My grandmother and father were both born there, and I lived for six decades in that town. It was the kind of place where, if you needed some vegetables for supper, you went to a neighbor who had a garden or took what you needed and left the money on the front porch. We lived on the main street, but were surrounded by many forested acres. Three rivers run through the town, and we had a large field behind our house. There were many fields throughout the town, and other towns nearby were similar in makeup. There were also farms in the area, and in the neighboring towns, too. They were very New England-type towns. Small, comfy, and cozy. When the children first came to live with us, both my husband and I worked. He worked at a transit company in a local city, and I worked as a paralegal. My job was a four-hour commute, two hours in the morning and two hours at night. I would be gone from the house for 12 hours a day at minimum. I often worked on weekends, too. My husband took a leave of absence from his job and stayed at home with the children for two and a half years. When he returned to work, he worked the night shift. That enabled him to watch the children during the day. He did his best with the children while I was at work, and given the circumstances, he did a great job. One day after work, when the children were six and four respectively, I came home to find the house in a state of disarray. Supper hadn't been made, and the kids were running to me with quite a story about a big gorilla that had been outside that day. The two youngest let me know during the afternoon they saw a big gorilla in front of the house, running along the street. They said it was very fast. Then the big gorilla jumped our picket fence and ran into our yard. The children said that their noses was pressed against the window pane, and that the big gorilla came up to the window, growled at them, and then pushed its paws against the window. The children said they tried to wake up my husband, but he had fallen asleep on the couch, and they could not rouse him. The big gorilla then ran into the backyard, where it broke some car windows, and threw about some trash cans. I didn't disbelieve the children. I was just too exhausted to deal with it, and responded with my that's nice comment that I used for anything I couldn't handle at the moment. I do recall reading in the newspaper a few days later that the police were warning folks about the vehicle damage, but I never gave that any further thought. I didn't give it any further thought even though a few years prior to the big gorilla incident I had seen a very large dead wolf that I presumed had been hit by a car laying on the roadside. It was not a coyote, nor was it a coy dog that we had in the area. I had seen pictures of wolves and this one was immense. I had personally seen koi dogs while riding my horse along the trails. The wolf body was gone the next day, and no mention by authorities of any wolf sightings was in the newspapers. I thought that was sort of unusual. Did we have wolves in our area? Wouldn't that be newsworthy? Did anyone else see this wolf? Obviously, someone had as its body was gone the following day. 
I also did not give the big gorilla story much further thought. Even though years before the children came, both my husband and I had witnessed large dog-type footprints in our backyard. We mentioned those prints to a friend of ours, the animal control officer in a nearby town, who didn't seem too impressed by our find. However, we never discussed anything further. I didn't give the big gorilla story much thought either, even though at about the same time we saw the dog prints on our backyard, our cats had started to go missing. I found one of our cats, Peter, the best hunter in town, high up on my neighbor's roof. The house was three stories with the first floor and second floor occupied by tenants, and the third, an attic. Lots of those older homes in New England always had full attics. I called Peter, managed to enter to the building, and climbed to the second floor with a closed basket. I climbed onto the porch railing, put the basket above my head, and up to the house gutters. And Peter obligingly dropped in. Thankfully, we managed to save our wonderful cat. Even though one of our friends asked why Peter was up on the roof, Peter was not scared of anything, but I was still not connecting the dots. When the children got a little older, we moved to North Carolina. It was in North Carolina when the children were nearer their teen years. I immediately spoke with our 12-year-old and 14-year-old separately. Do you remember the time you told me the story about the big gorilla? The 12-year-old energetically told me every single thing she remembered. The animal was very large and very fast. It had black hair and a long bushy tail. It growled. It had paws with fingers. It had stood up and pushed on the window with those paws. It ran very fast and had jumped over the fence. It had ran into the backyard and made a lot of noise breaking things. The twelve-year-old said it did not have the face of a gorilla or a monkey, but she couldn't tell more about the face because of the hair. The fourteen-year-old shivered when I asked if he remembered it. He said he would never forget that thing coming into the yard. He remembers it clearly as if it were yesterday. He too remembers the swiftness of the creature, the black hair on it, and how it had jumped the fence and was running amok from the front to the backyard. He said he doesn't know what it was and still doesn't, but that he hopes never to see anything like it again. The children now know about Dogmen, Bigfoot, and other cryptids. They didn't when they saw the big gorilla, though. Neither did I. We've all received an education. We're aware that Dogmen don't always stay in the forests. They're often seen among neighborhoods, and perhaps, just perhaps, the creature my children saw all those years ago was just that, a dogman in a small New England town. I'm reporting a possible dogman sighting, based on the info provided by my son and his friend. This occurred in Montgomery, Massachusetts. As a four-wheel enthusiast, my oldest son has become familiar with off-roading trails and rural routes that he and his friends use regularly, often at night. On this occasion, they were in his Ford Explorer, following a familiar route in a rural town through a remote wooded area. Being winter, the plows stopped at a certain point, leaving a bank of snow at that point, marking where the town abandoned maintenance of that unpaved road for the winter leaving further use of this road to those who dare. As my son related, he four-wheeled through the snowbank and drove along the road, which winded over a mountain. He concentrated on his driving, focusing on the road, as his close friend sat in the front passenger seat. Suddenly, his friend exclaimed, Look! Look! What's that? What is that? My son didn't lift up his eyes to see it because he wanted to stay on the road. His buddy pointed to where it went, so my son quickly swung his truck around and illuminated the area with his off-road lights and headlights. His friend described what he saw as a running-like wolf, but not a wolf. 
He said it was a big like bear, but not a bear. He also said it had long hair and was lighter in color than a brown bear. He said it was gray in color. They sat there for a minute or so, staring into the darkness. Suddenly, something pushed the SUV from behind, making it slide along the muddy snowy road a short distance. They both whipped their heads around, only to see the blackness of night out the rear window. Then he quickly started the truck and sped out of there, not seeing the creatures again. My son stated that it could not have been the same creature his buddy spotted, because once he had illuminated the area with the truck's lights, they would have spotted movement against the white snow background. Another of my son's friends insisted this was a Bigfoot, as he had an encounter years ago, but this description seems to better fit a dog man. This experience, whatever it was, is absolutely true. I was driving home from work on a six-lane highway, heading west into Hamilton, Ontario. As I drove on my side of the highway, I saw a dog cross from the left side to the right. That area is full of trees, bushes, channels, and ravines of water that are offshoots of Lake Ontario. When I saw the dog, it was approximately half of a kilometer ahead of me. The astonishing aspect of this dog, I'm certain it was a dog, was that its length from nose to rump, excluding its tail, covered almost the full width of the lane, eight feet. Where it was heading was back into a small valley, filled with heavy forestation and a ravine. I couldn't believe a dog could grow to that size. I still remind my boyfriend of this occasionally. I have no witnesses.